Welcome, everyone. Good morning to you and good evening, uh, depending on where you are throughout the world. Nice to be back. Uh, hopefully, uh, we finally got this real trading with Larry Williams down a little bit, kind of uh, uh, getting accustomed to doing this. Hopefully, we have a smoother presentation this week. Uh, as we do every week, I'm going to talk about some unknown growth stock, one that's really very been a great stock for a long time for us. But before I do that, I want to tell you what I'll be talking about today. We're going to do a Bitcoin forecast for the Bitcoin people. I'm also going to give you the best seasonal trades of the year for six stocks. Oh, wait to see these are just great trades. I'm also spill the beans on moving averages. A lot of people use moving average. Do they work? How do you use them? Can they help? What do you do with it? We'll talk about that. Also, the United States stock market, gold, and a lot of other stuff. Plus, we're going to have a contest to give away free subscriptions to my weekly market commentary. A couple of really interesting questions coming up uh, and this week. So get ready. And here we go. Look at this great growth stock. Wow, oh, my gosh. Another one of those stocks that really doesn't know how to go down. No, it's not biotech. It's not biomechanic or biomed or bio anything. It's O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. Um, you know, all they do is work on cars and have parts for cars and stuff. But what a tremendous stock this has been for a long time period. It began with one store in Springfield, Missouri in 1957. That was that one store by the O'Reilly family. They now have more than 5,200 stores and in 47 states. Uh, they've really grown through acquisitions and uh, also building new stores and expanding their business. Uh, but it's really been a great growth company, as you can see. And it's one of those stocks that's way off the radar screen because who thinks about a company that sells stuff for your auto? as being a great growth stock, but it certainly has been. Right now, I want to talk about where it is here. The P ratio is 25. That's okay. Forward P ratio is 21.9. So, you know, a lot of these growth stocks have P ratios of 80 or 90. Well, this is certainly not in that range. One of the disturbing things to me is I love to look at price sales ratio and the price sales at 3.3 is a little high, but it's typically been this way for O'Reilly Auto Parts. Earnings per share next year should be about 12%. Projected for the next five years, 15%. So it looks like there's growth ahead for O'Reilly. The nice thing is they've done, uh, let's go back to the stock. They have almost $10 billion in sales. Isn't that amazing? Auto parts, $10 billion. They have uh, almost a 14% profit margin. So there's plenty of room in there. If things go wrong for a while, they can still make money. They have almost 50,000 employees. Uh, I do like the fact that recently there's been some insider buying in this stock, and that's really good news. I like to see insiders buying. Uh, they've been beating the earnings on a consistent basis. That's good. This is not a dividend stock. The money you're going to make on this one is going to be from growth of the price, not from dividends. So if you're a dividend guy, and I will be doing a feature on high dividend returns and high yield investing probably a couple of weeks from now. Uh, we've done a lot of that ourselves, and maybe I can add a little bit to your knowledge on that as well. So we will cover dividend investing eventually in this television program for StockCharts.com. Here is a seasonal pattern for O'Reilly. Typically, this time of the year, the market gets pretty strong for O'Reilly. It runs up, pulls back, and con continues moving higher into the first of the year. Big gap recently. Again, they beat earnings reports. So do we want to buy it right here, right now? Probably not. Uh, my index of professional buying, you can see when it's very high, it means professionals are buying the stock. On this recent rally, they've actually moved a little bit to the sell side. So my choice would be to wait for this to pull back a little bit. Then we could look for perhaps a better opportunity to be a buyer of the stock. Cycle forecast? Well, it also suggests the same thing that we should come down into the middle of this month and then we should start to see a rally at the end of the uh, the year, we should also start to see a rally. Cycle's done a pretty good job of navigating, giving us an advance warning. Probably in February, we should see a more significant decline in the market. But that's uh, remember, Cycle's, that doesn't really tell us a trend as much. It says we want to be a buyer here, a seller here, a buyer here, a short-term pullback, and a buyer here. So it forecasts two buy points coming up uh, the middle of this month, the latter part of, of November. 
and then right at the first of the year. So that's our take on O'Reilly Auto Parts. A very short-term forecast, this is where I combine the three most dominant cycles in the market. It says we're gonna go down until again about the middle of November. So that also backs up our long-term forecast. So if you wanna buy it today, right here, right now, no way. On a pullback though, I'd be interested in purchasing O'Reilly Auto Parts, a great growth stock. Beware of the bears. Oh, the market's are new high. We've been showing these bear signs here since we started doing this uh, six weeks ago. And uh, the market continues churning higher and higher. One of the things that people have been so bearish on the market is the yield curve. The yield curve, you've got to be really careful of it. And you can't get a better view of how to use it than on stockchart.com. It's the trend of the curve that matters. Notice the trend of the curve is up now. That's this area right here. That's bullish. At this peak in the market, at this peak in the market, the trend was down. You can go back and review some of the issues I've done before where we showed this. And it continues to be in an uptrend. So all the Cassandras that uh, dredge out this yield curve thing as being one reason why the market's going to crash. Well, A, the market hasn't crashed. B, they're not looking at the direction of the yield curve. Uh, and also the yield curve has not been perfect as a good indicator. We do use it, but we're looking at the direction of it. And the nice thing on stockcharts.com, you can just pull this up under yield curve. You can touch any place on the chart and it'll show you what that curve is doing. And when the curve is sloping downwards, that's the selling opportunity in the market. Okay, spilling the beans on moving averages. Oh, you're going to like this. And maybe you won't especially if you're really into moving averages. But here is the truth of moving averages. So here's the moving average for those who aren't aware of it. The moving average, the red one crosses a blue one, so you buy long and it crosses over here, so you get a nice trade in the market. This is Costco. What could be better than that? We found the instant way to wealth. Uh, but then here's the same stock. We cross here, so we sell. We cross up here, we buy. We cross here, we sell. We Oh, see what happens when you get in a trading range, even here where you buy here, and by the time you cross below, you sell over here, you lost. So sure, a moving average will capture a big uptrend in the market, but when you get into a trading range, it will get beat to death. By the way, one of the more interesting questions I've ever had in my life years ago before the internet, when people wrote letters, I had a subscriber who wrote and wanted to know how many days were in a 10-day moving average. Now, that's not going to be the question we're going to use this week for our uh, free subscription to our uh, uh, market commentary. But it was uh, one of the more interesting questions I've ever received. There are 10 days, by the way, in a 10-day moving average. Okay, so here's the truth. I look at some moving average studies in the S&P E-mini. From 2000 to 2010, the best moving average crossover was to buy when a 10-day moving average crossed above a 60. 73% of those trades were winners that made almost half a million dollars, $446,000. Wow, call the cops, is that spectacular? However, when we went from 2010 to 2019, same moving average crossover, down and getting above 60, 38% of the trades were winners and it lost 97,000, almost $100,000. Hmm, didn't work, did it? It did not hold up. And this really confirms a Merrill Lynch study that I saw when I was trading starts or started trading commodities in the 1970s. Um, Merrill Lynch did a survey that showed the best moving averages for system trading of all active future contracts. As I recall, it was like a 45 day for cattle and 13 days for soybean oil. They had def the best. And so I thought, wow, that looks like a great way to make money. So in that study, every commodity was profitable and lots of profits in most all the markets. Well, that really excited us back then. We didn't know about moving averages and nobody had spilled the beans on moving averages. I tested then those best fit systems from 1974 to 1984. The study came out in about 1973, by the way. And uh, I tested it then to see how those systems, if you just simply held on to those systems that Merrill Lynch said were the best, based on moving averages in all actively traded commodities. And the results were a disaster. I mean, a real disaster. None of the markets made money in the future with what were the best parameters 
in the Merrill Lynch study. None of them did. So the truth from the government is really good on moving averages. Past performance is no guarantee of future success. Moving averages don't work as a mechanical system. Maybe you can use them to help you identify trend, to give you some insight into the market and understand the markets. But in terms of a moving average crossover buy sell system, they don't work. The ugly truth is things change. What moving averages worked the best in the past won't work the best in the future. I did another study in gold where we looked at the best moving average from 1990 to 2005. Uh, 35 and 20 were the best, made $26,000. But same thing, 2005 to 2019, it lost money. And interestingly enough, if you looked at the very best moving average crossover from 2005 to 2019, it was 10 getting above a 30, but that was in none of the prior data. So again, it drives home the point. They don't work very well. So there's another way you can look at moving average, just reverse it upside down. In 1990 to 2005, the best crossover was to sell when a 29-day average got above a 21-day average. You're going to do the reverse of what you think. It made money, $39,000. However, 2005, 2019, yeah, it made money, $12,500, but it had a $95,000 drawdown, not so good. So a real shock about moving averages on their own, they don't work. Somebody tells you they got a moving average system, wave goodbye. There's no evidence that these things work at all. Again, they can be a tool, but as a mechanical system, I've only been doing this 58 years now. I haven't seen any of them that work in the future. So the truth is from the government again, past performance is no guarantee of future success. So it's contest time. First person to type in the correct answer is going to win you ready? Get ready. Here we go. Free two month subscription to our weekly commentaries. What weighs more, a pound of gold or a pound of feathers or no difference? And why? Got it? Okay, guys and gals, go for it. Let's see if we can get a winner this week. Bitcoin. Let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Here's my cycle forecast for Bitcoin. Uh, you can see Bitcoin has had some pretty cyclical action in the marketplace. It suggests a little pullback in here now and equally going higher until the first of the year. Uh, but a pullback uh, about the middle of the, this month and then right around the first week of December uh, suggests another buying opportunity. No rip roaring runaway market, but gradually working higher in a choppy trading range type of affair. Looks like the future for Bitcoin. Technically speaking, it looks like this. The professionals have been selling this market on this rally, which is why I think right here, right now, we're going to see a decline in Bitcoin, a pullback in an overall uptrend. Accumulation, which gave a great buy signal back here, lower price, higher accumulation. Uh, right now, it's not so positive, is it? The price has been higher, but not matched by accumulation. So another reason I think we can see this market pull back in here and uh, then set up a buying opportunity, kind of like what we saw the longer term cycle forecast is for Bitcoin. So that's our look at Bitcoin. And we're gonna talk about stocks when we get back. Uh, we've been talking about stock going to new high, led by the critical advanced decline line. That's been exactly what's happened. As you can see, we've continued moving higher in this market. And I still think we're going to new highs uh, substantially, which we of course are doing today as I speak right now. Uh, and I'm going to give you an update on the forecast as well. So we're going to look at a lot at stocks and I'll do that after we come back from the break. And I do really trade. Here's my current position. That's 50 long S&Ps, open profit about $208,000. So for those of you who think I'm just a television guy, no, I really trade. So let's come back in a few moments and I'm going to show you the future of the market. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to now look at the future of the markets and we do have a winner on our contest of what weighs more, a pound of gold or a pound of feathers. Uh, we'll get to the answer and show you the answer in a moment, but uh, we do have a winner. Uh, and Rachel, if you can give me the winner's name, let's announce the lucky winner. In uh, sorry, Larry, hold on just a second. I'm looking at them, getting, having a bit of a problem reading this right now. Mouse, no difference. In terms of here, it is. It's Andy, and it's pound of feathers. Troy, weight of great. 
Andy is the winner, and I'll explain why Andy won in a moment, because a lot of people, I'm certain, saying, oh, come on, they're both way the same. They don't. You'll see in a moment. Um, I like to use the advanced decline line to look at the cycles in the advanced decline line. That's the chart we're looking at now to tell me when the market can really take off. It looks like we could have a pullback in here. And then around the 12th of November, we start to move back to the upside. So if we do start to back and forth in here, I've got to be looking to take profits in the market here. I actually have, I think we showed on the last chart. You can see where I want to take profits up here, not too far from where we are. About that 3,108, 3,110 area. That's where I'm looking to take profits because this has had a great run. Might go a lot higher, but if I can get out of here, hey, I'm really happy with that. So any pullback in here, you want to be a buyer. We will have the year-end rally we've been talking about. And if we look at a cycle forecast for the Dow, which is a lot more data, and about the same thing. We could pull back in here, but look at the cyclical strength that comes in this market. So guys and gals, get ready for that. Last week's comments in the last 21 years, the S&P has rallied 95% of the time for two trading days in November. What a strong seasonal trade. And again, it did it. In, in 2019, and I think you're going to see it'll happen in 2020. So there's a trade for you a year in advance. Contest time. Why does gold weigh less than a pound of feathers? Well, there are 12 ounces in a troy pound. A pound of feathers weighs 453.59 grams. A pound of gold weighs 373 grams. Remember, gold is measured by troy pounds and feathers measured by average deploy with 16 ounces in a pound of feathers versus 12 troy ounces in a pound of gold and now you know why great trivia question why a pound of feathers weighs more than a pound of gold and congratulations dandy for the right question you're probably a gold dealer we talked last week about very short-term cycles for the s p e minis you know, this is where we left it said hey this market should start to come down and rally and this is what happened. That's where we were on television. And you can see that's what happened in the marketplace. So another reason why you cycles, I think they can be really helpful in giving us a direction, a roadmap. Are they perfect? No way. There ain't nothing in this business that is perfect. But in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So any roadmap is helpful. Okay, let's look at some potential trades. Oh, grab onto your seatbelt. I got some for you. Is a season to rally. This is the seasonal pattern of Walmart. Walmart year in, year out has rallied from uh, about the first part of October, but especially gets strong going into and after Black Friday. So any short-term pullbacks in Walmart, I want to be a buyer. This has been a really strong seasonal pattern in Walmart, as well as Costco. There's a seasonal pattern in Costco. It goes up to about mm, the first week of December. Uh, Walmart, Costco, giant, great big retailers, and they get really strong this time of the year because of Christmas sales, real reasons for things to happen. See, I don't think the charts move markets. I think conditions move markets, and that's a huge difference between how most people try to predict the future. Another one is Target, another retailer. A lot of seasonal strength comes in, a little dip, and again, it rallies. So another seasonal trade in large retail companies. Now, if you don't want to buy Target, you don't buy Walmart, you could go to ETF um, or you could go to the jewelry stores. This is Tiffany. Tiffany, again, also has a strong seasonal pattern, gapped up. It's just following the seasonal pattern. This is one of those year in, year out trades. And even at high price levels, we've seen some buying coming in. So I expect to see a continuation of the rally in Tiffany until about the second, first, second week in December. Then you want to look for a short sale. And here's the ETF that represents uh, retail stores. And again, we see the same seasonal pattern. So year in, year out, we've seen a strong seasonal pattern uh, in these uh, retail stocks to rally because of Christmas sales, because of Black Friday, because people are out shopping. Investors apparently wake up and say, oh, my gosh, yeah, we ought to buy these stocks. And they do, and they rally, and there's your trades for you. Also, FedEx, they got to deliver the stuff, right? So there's the FedEx seasonal pattern. You can see that's a real strong seasonal pattern. FedEx comes down and rallies up until about the middle of December. Year in, year out. That's the way FedEx is traded. 
Okay, well, let's talk about gold now that you know that it's measured by troy ounces, not ever deploy, and that a pound of feathers weighs more than a pound of gold. Uh, I still think gold is going to lose its luster. And here we are on a weekly basis. The seasonal pattern is down for gold. It is overvalued. It has been in this entire zone. It's been overvalued. It was undervalued down here. The commercial zones of the people that use and produce gold, well, they're still selling this market short. So I'm not sure. I'm looking for a place to sell it. We have very high open interest. The public is really bullish. The producers are short. So I think who's going to win is the only question. Public or the professional? Well, clearly the professionals. Technically speaking, we showed this chart a couple of weeks ago. We said when these two lines cross this vector, it'll be like the market getting electrocuted on October 31st. And that's exactly what happened. Went right up October 31st and down it came. Really interesting. You can draw these lines on your charts and you're going to see this happen quite a bit. Kind of my little technical goodie for the day for you. Long term trend though, gold still to the downside, which means I want to sell a rally in here. I just haven't found it. Now, this is up to date now. I'd like to see the market pull back in here. Uh, I just don't have a sell signal yet, but if I see it, I'll get it. And I would suggest if you see one in whatever work you do, you could do the same thing. Silver too has been weaker than gold, so I might want to actually focus my short selling on silver, not on gold. Definitely want to pay attention to those markets. Okay, we have another contest time. Another winner, two months free subscription. First person to type in the correct answer box wins. Uh, you ready? Here we go. Who gave us a bull market, bear market analogy? We always talk about a bull market and a bear market, and bull means up, bear means down. Where did all this come from? Who came up with this idea? Whoever can answer that first wins a two month subscription to my. Uh, weekly market commentaries and Rachel will jump in if and when we get a winner bonds ah, we've talked about bonds here still a lot of confusion in my mind on bonds um, I think we could get a buy signal in this market I've been trying to get in here for a, a buy point in bonds they just haven't responded I actually had buys above yesterday's high market didn't take it out at all so I'm still flat I think the bigger picture of bonds, though, is that we're going to see this market rally a little bit in here and then come down. The bigger picture, our inner market forecast suggests we come down, but cycles say that we can still rally in here. So it's a mixed bag. Hey, Larry. Back to that. Yes, Rachel. We already have a winner. And we have winner, winner, winner. Who won? Winner, winner, winner. Krishna. Krishna won. Okay, and I'll give the answer to everybody in a moment. Congratulations, Krista, unless you be a very well-read person, not only a stock and commodity trader. So the cycles I'm using here, I use Timing Solution software. People have asked about that. Again, I don't get anything from Timing Solution software. Um, I just do it because it's been a great piece of software to get uh, figure out cycles. Uh, so still in bonds, looking for a place to get long or short, and I can't find any. So maybe I'll miss the whole trade. That happens. I don't catch them all. Coco, a follow-up on some of these trades we had. Uh, stop. The market's broken a little bit. Finally, stop above. Highest high of the last two days. Market still under distribution. Want to cover back in here. If we get a nice drop into this area back here, let's cover that short position. Swiss franc, well, the easy trade here. Stop is right below. The recent lows target if we can take out these highs in here uh, that would be your target for the Swiss franc so I'll follow up these trades as well contest time who gave it bull market bear market analogy Mark Twain Mark Twain was a newspaper reporter he went to one of those bull bear fights in California at the same time the stock market was crashing in New York City and he talked about the bears walking on Wall Street and crashing down with a swipe of the paw Stock prices, and that's where it came from. Mark Twain, perhaps America's greatest novelist and author. Crude oil, another one of these markets. Sometimes this stuff is not clear to me. Uh, and after doing it all these years, uh, you can imagine if it's not clear to me, don't expect you're going to have clarity, <clears throat> excuse me, all the time you're trading. It just doesn't exist. Sometimes it does. Seasonal patterns are mixed in here. I think we did get a rally in the market. <clears throat> Excuse me. We talked about that last week. Trend line break, getting above it, eight-day highs, all that. 
And that has now taken place. But I do want to have stops right below the low of the breakout day. And if we can get back into this area, uh, close to these old closing highs in here, I want to take profits in the trade. I personally am short heating oil. It's been a little bit weaker in the market. So as you can tell, I'm not really in love with this, but uh, crude oil has been stronger, have trailing stops. Corn and the grains, we talked about this. Again, this is how I trade real reasons. The red line is commercial, the users and producers of the market. Well, I'll go back to the slide. And they were selling down here. That suggests this market can come to the downside. That's a reason why cycles say, well, that's about the time we'd expect the market to come down. If the commercials were selling over here, we're still in up phase of the cycle. Notice the cycle says about the 5th of December, we should bottom. We pointed out corn was under distribution and we made higher prices than high, but not an accumulation diversion. That's bearish. And seasonal patterns also to the downside. So I like to do that. I like to have a lot of things going for my trades, not just one thing, at one line over another. Now, corn has broken to the downside. We got really lucky on this trade. Accumulation's falling apart. If we can get back down into these old closes back here, let's cover our short position. Trailing stop, highest high of the last three days. And then I think we should see this market move down into our target area. Uh, if you like what you've seen, you can learn to trade with me. Uh, we do have my uh, market commentaries where I go over stuff just like this and show my trades and trades that I'm doing. It's only $30 a month and there's a lot of free stuff too. That's all at IReallyTrade.com. So you might want to go there and take a look at things. Uh, on And uh, oh, this should be interesting because I think um, something else. I just got filled on something today. I heard the voice of my speaker say order filled. Um, so, uh, if you are a serious trader, I think a couple of things to point out is that seasonals work really well. They don't work every year. So if you're going to look at seasonals, you want to look at them in conjunction with something else, like perhaps distribution in the marketplace. So you have a combination of ingredients and perhaps the cycles in the marketplace. So this is what really makes this stuff work is that you get a combination of things to set up a trade. I think I'm a conditional trader, not a technical trader. I want conditions to set these trades up. And guys and gals, I'd really advise this. It's going to help you a lot. You can go find these conditions or learn from me, whoever. It doesn't matter. A lot of good people out there. But if you become a conditional trader, I think you're going to find a lot more success in the marketplace. That's really where the money is. And, and very short-term trading, uh, very difficult to do. Uh, you can capture these larger moves. You saw my S&P trade uh, with the 50 lot contracts so almost got a $300,000 profit on because I've held it for a little bit. Um, so that's going to wrap up this week. If you do want to learn to trade, come to our website, iridatrade.com. Pretty interesting experience for you to go through. And there's a lot of free stuff there. Uh, if you do have questions, let Rachel know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discover or to cover, not discover. Uh, in the coming week, just let us know and we'll try to do that. We try to make the show better each time. Um, and I'm still learning. So and inputs from you guys always help. So that's going to wrap it up for this week. And I look forward to coming back next week with more trades and more updates on the trades that we've talked about. So until next week, this is your trading buddy wishing you good luck and good trading. Mm -hmm.